Welcome, everybody, to Navigating Change, the podcast from Tybal Inc. I'm Pete Wright, and that guy over there is Howard Tybal. Ty- uh. I thought I'm supposed to say my own name. You, do this, you keep changing the we've rules only, on We've me. only been doing this three years, Howard. Yeah, only well, three. No, always messing only with me. Only three. Uh, we have a, I, I'm a man consistently amazed at the caliber of guests that answer the call when they see your name on the caller ID. We have another one of those today, uh, a fantastic <laughs> guest, uh, <laughs> John Hurley, president of Canisius College. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm happy to be here. Uh, it, it, this is it is such a fantastic conversation. We, Howard and I have talked uh, about you and your institution at great length. And one of the things that he has said to me quite recently is that the reason he loves working within and around Canisius is with, be- John, with John in particular. With John in sure. particular. All right. Okay, is because you. this is an institution that takes its place in higher education very seriously. Howard, I wonder if you could talk, uh, reflect a little bit on that comment and tell us uh, what you mean as you as we kick off this conversation with John. Well, you know, I've had the opportunity to work with John for uh, probably coming up in five years, John. And, you know, John will tell uh, his story in a, a couple minutes. But really, the thing that is so impressive for me is uh, how John has found a way to speak truth around the brutal facts and having a positive vision around the future, but at the same time, having to deal with some real harsh realities in an in a academic environment which is not prone to see urgency in the same ways that a corporation does. And I have come to have such a deep appreciation for how John has found a way to both capture the hearts and minds of people at the same time have them understand that it's all not, you know, peaches and roses and everything's fine. So I, I think John's at a point in his work, which which I think is so critical, uh, to be able to start telling the story about what does it mean, like, where we're going. And I think, John, you've always had that vision about where it is. And then, you know, there's the harsh realities of what you enter into as a president. And I see this with other presidents, too. So... You know, the thing that you have shared with me, and I know you're coming up on your convocation, is at the heart of what you are focusing on is what does it mean for us to be consistent with our mission? And here's what my vision is for the future. So I want to give you the opportunity to talk a little bit about sort of how you got to today and and, and where you're going and, and just have this be a conversation for the three of us going forward. Well, thanks, Howard. And I think there is a, a life cycle that presidents have that starts with arriving on a campus and having the campus wait expectantly for the announcement of the vision as though uh, a new president uh, is the oracle at Delphi and possesses all truth and all knowledge about what could be at a particular institution. Um, in my own case at Canisius, I am a graduate. I have had a lifelong connection with the school. I think 15 of my family members have gotten degrees. And I, um, at the time I became president, I had been here 13 years as vice president. Still, I felt as president, it was presumptuous for me to start right out of the box by announcing a vision of where I, as one individual, saw the college going. And so what I did, at least initially, was to uh, ask the campus to join with me in an exploration of what might be possible given all the stresses and strains that we saw out there. And when I say stresses and strains, I mean all of the things that came cascading down after the collapse of the financial markets in 2008. And we embarked on that. And um, so I would say at the beginning of my term as president, I did not completely ever articulate a vision. I had an idea of where we needed to go. But in many ways, what we were doing is testing the marketplace and seeing where the economy was going and trying to respond to this this overarching concern that students and parents had about the expense of higher education and the job market after they got finished. So fast forward now, I'm starting my fifth year as president, and 
I think we've been through what I would say is probably the worst of the storm. And it's been three years that I would characterize as fairly rocky. It has involved, uh, in business terms, I think a classic right-sizing of the institution to match what we saw as the new reality in enrollment. And that involved some painful discussions, and certainly there were morale issues, and certainly people had to change the way they were doing things. But as we reached the end of that three-year cycle, I found that people were asking, what does the future hold for us? We've been through this. Now, now where do we go from here? And so, um, as I found here uh, in each summer uh, after the academic year, I use the summer uh, not only to recharge in terms of vacation, but it's a time to step back and you get more quiet time in your office. You're able to think about what you've been through over the past year. You're able to recalibrate. And so this summer I've spent a lot of time working on uh, really that vision to answer what I think is a very legitimate question about those who have worked so hard to get us through this rough patch to describe a future uh, for them. And it's a future, I think, that we really have um, many reasons to be optimistic. I, I, and, I, and I announced this to the campus, understanding that, you know, th there are a lot of people who are down about things. They've, they've been working harder. They've had to do new things. They feel, un they feel very uncertain about the future. So again, it's, it's an announcement of a vision but it's going to be an invitation of the campus mm -hmm. to join me in a dialogue about that, to explore all of the, the contours and the boundaries of that vision. And, to, and as I say, to, to, to see just how good we can be, because I, I, I think we can be very, very good. So, so, so Pete, you see what I'm talking about? I'm telling you, John, that in all the time I've worked with you, the, the thing I, I listen to you and, and, uh, you're practicing what you are preaching. And I think in, in the course of, of moving from that survive mindset to thrive mindset, this is what people want to hear. And, and I think you've always had it, but the dilemma has been is that to share a positive view in the future when what you're doing is being knee deep in trying to get through problems, you could argue that people wouldn't even be able to hear it at that point. And I think what you're doing is you're getting out right at the point where maybe people can start to hear where you want to go. I, you know, it's an interesting thing, too, spinning off of that. John, I mean, you're, you're hitting these the, your fifth year here. Uh, how... I, I, I'm not even sure how to accurately frame this question. I'm just going to give it a shot here. You uh, were stuck in a position of, as you say, right-sizing the institution. And uh, at the same time, the presidential challenge is, how do you cement the foundation of leadership to continue to deliver on the core mission of the institution in a time where, where you are having such incredibly difficult conversations with people uh, and, and budgetary conversations and staff conversations uh, to set yourself up at this point so that now you have a platform of trust that they will listen to you when you start this new dialogue. Does that make any sense? Well, yeah, and I guess I would answer it two ways. Um, number one, on the, the just in terms of how you do it, uh, in terms of process, uh, I think it's been all about communication, and it's been about creating a a, a culture of open communication. You know, as Jim Collins says in his book, it's a it, it's creating a culture where where you can confront brutal facts but never lose faith. And so you lead with questions and not, uh, not answers and not coercion. And you try to create uh, a place where people feel that they can, they can ask questions. And so, you know, just on the process side, um, I've been um, paying a lot of attention to um, communicating with the campus by email, by hosting town hall meetings, by making myself available, maybe more so than I might to the faculty senate, to um, hosting small social gatherings, all the things that, that, that keep a conversation going. And, and I think avoid the, 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 the common thing that happens when time gets, times get tough, which is people are, uh, pointing at uh, pointing at someone and projecting a view or an opinion onto that person, or 
saying that person is no good or that person doesn't have our best interests. If you stay in their face and you keep talking to them, it makes it very difficult for them to, to, to keep you at arm's length. So, so the communication part has been key. Um, apart from the process though, I have come to see, and I guess I, you know, you hear about this all the time. I've seen it in other organizations, I guess, but I've come to be a real believer in the importance of mission and being very clear on mission. So we have come back again and again to our mission statement, which talks about providing this transformative education for our students. And I would say that everything that we have done over the past uh, three years has been done with, a, with an eye clearly focused on how does this impact the quality of the education that we're providing to our students. And I can say here, uh, sit here uh, three years later and say confidently that although we've been through dramatic change, we have not affected uh, academic quality in a negative fashion. In many ways, we've enhanced it. And I, I guess I would be reluctant to speak for my faculty, but I think I think the vast majority of our faculty would agree that they remain committed to that same thing and that what we're doing hasn't impacted that in, in a material way. So as you and I have talked about, John, um, in your office, uh, I'd love if you could give the ele elevator pitch version of your vision and the kinds of things that you, I think have, it's always been there for you, but I think you have articulated and you now have really clear. So would you be willing to sort of say a few words about that? Sure, I think um, stepping back this summer and thinking about that, I've said, I've said to myself, our circumstances right now, both the particular situation that Canisius College finds itself in and the demands of the external marketplace, all those things that are going out in, uh, on in the world outside us require that we think about a new vision uh, for Canisius. And, and as I've thought about that and worked through some many ideas, uh, I've come down to summarizing in three words, redefinition, revitalization, and innovation. So let me just unpack that just a bit. Redefinition, I think I'm calling on the campus to redefine what it means to be a student-centered university. And, and, and that's, um, that sounds in some ways like academic buzzwords, but each one of those words is very important. Revitalization, I'm seeking everyone's commitment to revitalize the academic program to take to take into account what the world demands of our students and what we need to do to provide that and third the pursuit of an innovative business model looking at our operations and saying how do we begin to operate in new ways that help with this redefinition of being student-centered that help with the delivery of a revitalized academic program and really sets us apart from a lot of other people in, in the higher education space. You know, John, what, you know, here's what I love about that as I hear you say it for the first time really this way. Uh, this redefinition in terms of being student-centered is really about the who, right? The who in terms of who we're trying to impact. Your revitalization is very much what you said earlier about this invitation, right? How are we gonna do this? We need to all put ourselves in this conversation to say, how are we gonna be part of the solution? Uh, it's very easy to be part of the problem. It's, it's sometimes very hard to step back and go, I don't like where this is going, but if I'm gonna play an impact, if I'm gonna be here, I gotta figure out how to be part of the solution. And the third thing is the innovative business model is really the enabler, but so in a sense, what's gonna help the institution focus more effectively on the mission? So it feels to me like you have captured the three critical legs uh, of, a, of a direction. And Pete, this is the first time you're hearing it, and I know, John, you're gonna be sharing this with the community. Uh, I'm just curious, Pete, hearing it for the first time, how does it, how does it resonate with you as you hear this? Well, you know, I'm coming at it from, uh, you know, from sort of 
both sides of the fence here. Uh, from a practical perspective, I, I I love it, and I love this discussion of the pursuit of an innovative business model. And I'm I'm curious, and we can talk about this in a in a moment. The the idea of cultivating an institution that accepts uh, cultural and uh, cultural risk in terms of taking cha making change uh, around the academic uh, delivery, the mission delivery, and the business model. I'm very interested in that. Um, on the the other side of the fence, I can understand how it would be difficult to establish. A, a sense of trust, and I, I love you already commented, John, on the sense of the faculty. I'm, I'm a member of a faculty community myself, and, and I know we have felt uh, burned in the past when the conversation of business model <laughs> arises. Uh, and so, you know, I establishing that sense of trust when you are cultivating a new vision that takes uh, into, uh, into account um, the dynamics of the economy uh, I imagine is quite challenging. You know, very often when you start having discussions, um, the, the first instinct, and I see this following the, the higher education media and certainly in dealing with my own faculty, it, maybe the first instinct is to think, this is, they're out to get tenure. They're, they're out to attack tenure and they're out to attack job security and they don't understand what it is that we do and how we do it. And um, Frank, I, I do not hold a PhD. I'm, I'm quite forthright about that. My faculty knows that. Um, there was some concern, I think, when I got hired because I didn't. But as one of the old Jesuits explained to me, um, he said, you know, they used to say that about priests and marriage counseling, too, that, you know, you didn't, you didn't have to be married to be able to counsel about it. And I said to our faculty, I don't think I had to teach in order to understand how hard your job is and right. to appreciate what you do. But the reason I say that is um, this, this isn't about tenure and it isn't about take, attacking the status of the faculty. In fact, my, my background before higher education was, was as a practicing lawyer in a large commercial firm. And, and I've said our faculty is very much like uh, partners in a professional service firm and we should be viewing the tenure tenure as a means of glue, of holding the organization together with highly skilled individuals who are in essence, who are, who are the essence of our product. So, so this hasn't been about the faculty and I think the fact that we haven't gone that route and that's a route, you know, unfortunately a lot of boards get mired in that because business executives look at this institution and they think that's the root of all evils. I, I have consistently counseled my board that that is not the root of the problem. The root of the problem is is other things. Now there are there's some job perks that maybe we have to talk about, but but the fundamental institution of tenure and and an appreciation for the difficulty of the job um, and 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 the craft of that profession is something that we we have to appreciate. And so I've tried to talk honestly about them, uh, about it with them, and and to bring them along in the discussion. And I think the fact that we haven't we haven't had uh, big disagreements on those uh, on those issues has been a positive thing for us. I, I that that's exactly. I mean, I, I asked the question. You know, how do you go about building a, a community of of trust in, you know, when you bring up these sort of challenges, faculty challenges, but that's exactly what I would want to hear as, as a member of your faculty. That sounds, you know, again, driving that home, that point around communication. Uh, I, I don't want to, Howard, if you have another question, please jump in, but I, I do want to uh, hear a few words, if you wouldn't mind, reflecting on this idea of, of, of building risk into your vision. Well, you know, there's risk at every turn here in higher education. That's, um, people, people say to me, how's the job? And I say, well, uh, I start with the line. There's a reason we call it work, um, <laughs> because these are these are challenging times. But but then again, n name an industry that isn't fraught with risk today. The, the world the world really is in the midst of a of a global digital revolution that is transforming the fundamental business model that we have known, and it and it affects everyone. There is, there is no one that can simply stand by and say, well, I don't have to be a participant in that. So, so there is risk and, and uh, that's why, you know, I want to announce a vision for the future, but, but I've said, but I want to say too to the campus and I, and I, and I, and I believe this from the, the experience of the past three years, what we've been through is not a one and done phenomena. Um, we have been in pursuit of, of a sounder financial footing for the, for the college, but there is no resting place 
called sound financial footing. That is to mean not a place where, where we can simply drop our guard and go back to the old ways of doing things because the storm has passed. So we need, no matter what we do, we need to remain vigilant, nimble, and and understanding that the world is going to change and that we have to change and we always have to be better. You know, and the great thing about that uh, is, you know, we it, the, the great thing in Jesuit universities is we have these Latin terms that, that um, as our uh, former superior generals say, in a minimum of words express a maximum of dynamic vision. And so we use the, the Latin word magis, which means more. And it's not more in terms of quantity, but it's more in terms of something more, something better, something that moves you closer to a vision. And so we're all about a pursuit of magis here and yes. saying, where does the more take us? And by the way, as a Jewish guy, I love this. I'm learning so much from John, right, John? I mean, wouldn't you agree that I have uh, I have changed since I met you? Have you noticed? Oh, don't go there, actually. I'm afraid what you're going to say. Uh, you know, we're given the lay presidents of the Jesuit universities are given small bottles of holy water, um, and you just never know when the time might be right for a baptism. <laughs> He's no loss for words. But actually, I want to come back to something here, John, that you talked about as, as Pete transitioned to this thing about bringing risk. In my work and in, in my working, uh, actually even speaking, I think about risk in a slightly different way. It's, it's not the risk that is external to us. It's being, bringing a risk mindset or risk, not aversion, but an acceptance of risk. Innovation, being willing to be innovative is risky. Being willing to experiment is risky. So I think what you've been attempting to do, uh, and, and I think all uh, heads of schools have been attempting to do, is to identify in what ways can we bring experimentation or a mindset of trying something and not throw the baby out with the bathwater when we bring up online education. The suggestion here is not we're going to like turn our school into an online university, but what does it mean to experiment? And I, and I think that at the heart of what you, when you talk about innovative business model or even being student centered, it's all about stepping back from how we've always done it and to say, how could we do this in a way to experiment with different ways of doing business? So, John, would you agree that this is the kind of mindset that we want to bring more to all levels in our institution to realize it's okay to experiment, uh, it's okay to fail, not fail from the point of view of things that could undermine us, but be willing to take risks and from those risks learn how to do things differently? Howard, I couldn't agree with you more that that's what needs to happen in institutions. I, I think as a starting point though, we have to understand you've got different personality types in an institution and people's tolerance for um, risk and uncertainty varies. And I would say, um, it, you know, it's difficult to talk about faculty members as a whole, but generally speaking, I think it's the case that they they want to be left alone to do what they do best. And one of the reasons that they're in this line of work is that they they like the certainty of it. And this whole discussion of risk and the dislocation that's occurred in higher education has been upsetting to people who feel that way. So so I don't think it's really a wise idea to to hammer away saying we're going to be risk takers and we're going to be innovative with people who aren't ready to have that kind of discussion. Now, that's not to say on the operational side of the college um, that we say to, that we can't say to people, look, we've got to change the way we do some things and you're going to have to continue to evolve while we move the faculty along at a more maybe deliberate pace on some things. Um, I think it's just a question of understanding the dynamics in a particular organization and calibrating both the uh, the message and the process to the audience and and it can be done yeah and not only that John I, I think that what you also have uh, 
since you're starting your presidency have done is is said I'm going to reach out and I'm going to put myself in a situation to listen and and the one thing I see as I travel around the country that resonates with people and, and I made this message even stronger on the administrative side, on, 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 the, on the administrative leadership to say, listen, if you want to build trust with your faculty, uh, if you want to build trust on the academic side of the house, you've got to find a way to really demonstrate empathetic listening and not going with an agenda, but be really interested in their point of view. Because so often is the case, we we do not listen to the side that has a point of view, and we're waiting to express our point of view. And the impact is uh, both sides walk away feeling like the other side doesn't understand them. And, and I think that one of the things you've been attempting to do, and, and some are interested and some are not, is to say, I really want to learn from you. And I think that's that's the best thing we can do is walk into a conversation and say, help me understand where you're coming from and just understand that I'm here to support you and I want you to understand where I'm coming from. That's a very hard thing to do, sometimes because our styles get in the way. Absolutely. I, I sat through a, a sales uh, seminar many years ago while I was still practicing law, and I learned the uh, concept of the 95s, and that is um, everyone walks into a conversation, and what they have in mind, 95% of what's on their brain is what they want to communicate to the other side. Mm. And in sales, if you do that, you're never going to pick up on the cues of the people you're trying to sell to. So they were trying to get people to recalibrate that 95%. And, you know, that's, I guess, in my experience in many, many settings, I found that to be the case, that people walk into conversations more concerned um, about um, speaking rather than listening. And even when they're listening, um, maybe listening with the 95% of what they ultimately want to get out. So we need to have conversations in which we're uh, truly listening. As Dr. Covey said, seek first to understand, then to be understood. And um, and I think that goes a long way with people. You know, I was in a... Um... I was in Seattle this week, and, and uh, a faculty member got up and said to me, you know, one of the things I'm concerned about, she said in front of all of her faculty, and I was in front of this workshop, she said, one of the things I'm concerned about is our changing policy with uh, uh, using technology, and whereas most of our kids right now are out in free time, out in the uh, community, and they're, and they're uh, being outdoors in this beautiful weather out here. Here. And as we change these policies, and again, this was the, even even though it's K through 12, I want people who are in higher ed to understand this. And her fear was is that they'd be sitting on their laptops because they're going to make this open door policy with online uh, and using online tools. And I looked at her in front of everybody, and I said, after she made this point, I said, "Can I ask you a question? Are you just looking to be heard, or are you looking for a decision right now?" And she's paused, and after probably 30 seconds, she really didn't have an answer. But really, after she sat down, she said, "I really." when we talked later, she just wanted to be heard. And I think so often we think that if we have to listen to somebody, that means that we need them or expecting them to do something. When, in fact, we just need to go out of our way to listen because people, when they feel heard, they can move on. So, so let me ask you something, John, as we move forward. What are you most excited about this year? As I, as I said earlier, I, I, uh, I, I suddenly got very encouraged over the summer with the growing sense that, that maybe th we had weathered the worst of the storm and that we, and that we really were on the, on the verge of being able to explore some exciting new things. So I, I, I found myself really from the middle of July now to the end of August just getting tremendously energized by the possibility that we, we wouldn't be dealing simply with, oh, a budget that didn't balance, oh, a revenue target that didn't get met. Now what are we going to do? How are we going to cut costs? And, and we could have a different kind of discussion. And, and frankly, I think the, uh, the, 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 the situation is just ripe to have that 
discussion right now. There are there are so many things converging in the world, and and we're and I, and I've said to the campus, we're we're at an inflection point here, and we have a we we have a we have some choices to make, and fortunately, we're not we're not going to be cluttered with. A lot of uh, a lot of the weeds being in the weeds of, of of a particular financial issue, we can start to we can start to have that discussion and and really look at it. You know, I I, I want to raise something. This is sort of getting back into some detail here that I see in in all my work with Jesuit schools, is one of the things that I think you're willing to do, is put some difficult conversations on the table. I have also worked at other Jesuit schools, uh, and listened to other Jesuit leaders, and I. I hear it always, this idea that one of the reasons why we can't have some of these elephant-in-the-room conversations is because it touches on not taking care of our people, and that built into our Jesuit way of being and is about taking care of the whole person. So discussions about workforce, discussions about compensation, discussions about anything that affects people are so difficult to deal with. So I'm curious, as you've had five years of this, how are you coming to reframe this idea uh, in the Jesuit context of taking care of the whole person, uh, taking care of the people that are working there in the context of having to make change? Well, I, you know, there was a, uh, a point in time, Howard, when I looked at things and said, um, there, there are two groups of people I have to be concerned with. If we're going to be downsizing or right-sizing, I have to be concerned with the people who are who are departing. But I also have to realize that if I don't make those difficult decisions, I'm jeopardizing the the the, the long-term future of the of the enterprise for the roughly 750 people who remain. And I've got an obligation to the people who have invested their entire lives in this in this institution. So it's um, it's it's not it's not callous by any by any means, but. I, I do have to stay focused on the uh, on what's best for the college and for the people who remain, and and if it means some tough decisions, well, we we shouldn't avoid making those tough decisions because it will just make life so much more difficult for everyone else. When is convocation for you? What day? Uh, our convocation is September fourth. And what what are you most excited about in terms of that day? Well, I've been um, through a series of emails and updates to the campus. I've been promoting the uh, convocation talk, and I've been uh, telling people that uh, this really is a uh, a critical time for us, and we need to um, we need to think about a uh, a new vision for the future, and. The uh, chair of my faculty senate told me the other day that they people had been reading the emails. I've piqued people's interest, and uh, in fact, he said, "Would you mind giving me a sneak preview uh, beforehand?" And I said, "Yeah," and I gave him some of what we've talked about this afternoon. But so it's um, I've been trying to build people's interest in this because one of the things I find, and I think this is true in in any organizational communication, you've got to think about reach and frequency. And um, I think I've been trying to preach similar types of messages, put similar types of questions on the table, and I'm not sure that they've been um, taken up or internalized maybe in the way I would have expected. And so now I'm going to be maybe a little bit more directive in this, in this talk. And uh, I want people to remember that Yes, we have articulated a vision for the future. We're working on some things. And, and the, the, the key for me afterwards will be to follow up on this and to make sure that this gets embedded in our strategic planning, that it gets embedded in every campus conversation that we have, and, um, and that we really make something of it. That's fantastic. It, it really is, and I know it's, it gets exactly to this point that I know I've labored on uh, probably too long in the past, so forgive me my repetitiveness here, but it's this idea that you as president, not just as a, a leader or a manager, uh, you know, a lay president or a priest, you are the custodian of a legacy, uh, a legacy of the institution, and that, that affords you the, the challenge and opportunity to make some very difficult decisions. I, it was my question, which I think you answered preemptively, uh, um, which is, uh, you know, your gauge of institutional support going into convocation, and it sounds like, uh, um, sounds like you you have certainly your your head around this issue, but uh, 
that faculty and, and uh, staff are even reading the emails is a good sign, <laughs> I'd probably say. Well, I, I think so, Peter. You know, I think, um, but, but, but I like to think I'm perceptive enough to, to, to pick up on the fact that people are weary with what we've been through. It, this is, yeah, this sure. hasn't been a happy time, yeah. And, yeah. and this is not, um, this is not about a pity party for me uh, having to have made decisions, it, and it isn't about you know, uh, you, you know. So often you you see in um, in plans or in 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 other kinds of uh, initiatives on campuses, people say, "Well, what we really need to do is work on morale." Yeah. And the the problem is with you know if you accept that, and I and I and I try to resist accepting that because if you accept that. Morale is a symptom of other things that are going on, things that, that run deeper. Morale is just the outward manifestation. So it's almost impossible to work on morale. That's beautiful, yeah. Y what you need to do is you need to work on the root causes of what's causing people to have bad morale or poor morale. Sure. And and we need to be able to talk honestly about that and, and, and be able to hit, say, it's it's when you do this, uh, without consulting us that gives us poor morale. Okay, then let's set up a process where I don't do that without consulting you. Not to well, say I won't do yeah. it, but we, we're going to have a discussion about it. And, and what you're doing by doing that is you're, you're, you're identifying morale as a symptom uh, versus the root cause. And you're also asking people to step deeper into the conversation and to be solutions oriented. And I think one of the reasons we're not that way is that it, we're often not asked to be solutions oriented. You know, we're often asked to give a, you know, how do we feel about it as opposed to we invite you into the process. There's a, there, I mean, there's a, a strong historical sort of legacy around leadership being responsible for figuring out all the answers. And I think that we're at a time right now where the schools that are smart and the leaders who are smart, they're saying we need to invite more people into the process so that we can get through it. And, and I think that's, in a sense, what you're doing by, in a sense, putting it, the question back in people's faces. All right, I hear you. That's not it. So tell me what you want to do. Often, I find, John, people don't immediately have the answer. But you still need to invite them into the question. You know, we've we've had this conversation, and I I, I don't I hope I'm not interrupting. I, I, we've had this conversation about the support and understanding and, and patience from this, uh, from your staff and faculty perspective. What is your sense of the uh, the support, understanding, and patience of the student body uh, around the direction of the institution? What is your what is your sense about their level of support as you kick off this this new year? Well, that's that's a great question, Pete, and that's that's I think the other part of this discussion that maybe we haven't spent enough time on, and that is when we begin to talk about uh, redefining student-centered and revitalizing your academic programs, it has to be done with an external focus, mm -hmm. and that means what what is it that our students are going to need to become lifelong learners in a global marketplace. And and I'll tell you, I, I mean, this is something I address at Open House when I speak. I address it at my freshman convocation. I'm constantly trying to put this on the table with, with prospective students and parents. And a lot of this, uh, it, it seems in a way to go over their heads, but I would say, at its most basic terms, in its in its most basic terms, what happens is that parents come to us and students come to us, and 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 the fundamental question is, okay, well, I'm going to go to the school, but how am I going to get a job? And and balancing what seems to be, let's let's for want of a better word, let me just use kind of a crass concern. Um, I think it happens to be a, an absolutely vital concern. We all got to work to make a living, but you know. There are some in the humanities who would say, well, that's not really what the purpose of an education is. Well, there may be other purposes to an education, but at the end of the day, I think this, in this, at this point in time in the world and in the United States, certainly, I think the people in higher education have to do a much better job of saying, what are we doing in very concrete terms, in very measurable terms, in very demonstrable terms? In what ways are we preparing our students to become lifelong learners in this new economy? And, and if we don't shape the curriculum in that direction, if we don't get hold of our students by the lapels when they walk in the door and say, look, 
this is what's going on in the world. These, these employment trends are out there. These are skills and competencies that people absolutely insist that you must have. You've got to incorporate this into your academic planning. And if we don't go out and, and get their attention and do that and then deliver it, deliver it in a way that we can measure and talk about, we're, we're not going to be around long. There are going to be, there, there are going to be um, disruptive forces in higher education that are going to pick off parts of what we do, and and we will cease to be relevant. And so, this is a this is a big challenge. And I think this is where, in the case of um, um, a lot of people who are within the academy, they they just want to be left alone to do what they what they do, but. It's got to be by reference to this external marketplace, and and we we got to be very honest and open and concrete with parents and students about this because this whole thing that we're calling college is an incredible investment of time and money, and if there isn't a return, um, there can be a return in the sense that we're going to touch students' souls and we're going to expand their minds in ways that they never dreamed possible, and and we think that's an essential part of the Jesuit brand. But it's also got to be things like, how am I going to get a job? Yeah, and John, the other piece besides that, I've heard board members say, and I think we got to go beyond this. Uh, the liberal arts education makes us a more critical thinker, and therefore that's a sufficient uh, justification for the advancement of the liberal, liberal arts. And I think what you're saying is, yes, that's true, but we cannot just say student-centered and not put some more meat on the bone around that about really helping them in that transition. And that doesn't mean that we're no longer a liberal arts education and that that's, we, we stand by those core values. At this, but we do need to not just say these words student-centered without really putting something in place that are going to help them as they transition out of the school. And that's what I'm hearing you say, and I think it's a powerful statement, and if people take that to heart, they will have to look very uh, critically at themselves and saying, how much do we really understand what our students need uh, in a way that will help them in this transition? So I think that's a, that's a powerful, uh, it's, it's almost like I would imagine, if you think about your three legs, that is probably the, the, the highest aspiration is to what does it mean for us to be student-centered and meet their needs? Well, that's right. And, and another part of that, too, Howard, that I hear in circles that I travel, uh, in business circles in the community, both regionally and, um, and, uh, and beyond, is not only do they want students to emerge from college with critical thinking skills, but when students sit in an interview, whether it be for graduate school or a, a job, they need to be able to explain in very concrete terms how is it that they exercise critical thinking. Give me real life examples. And I think we're content to just say, well, a liberal arts-based core curriculum at Canisius College prepares students to be critical thinkers. Well, if they can't describe how they do it, it's going to be hard to sell the merits of that. And so this is, uh, in, and I'm not talking about um, changing our approaches on critical thinking. It's just looking for opportunities to demonstrate to the students, hey, this is what we mean by critical thinking. Now let's talk about ways that that could be applied so that the students get familiar with that and can describe it when they go out in the world. I'm telling you, I can't tell you how much that inspires me. And if I was a parent of a 17-year-old right now thinking or knowing that a particular institution makes that uh, as front and center as giving my kid a great liberal arts education, I would be paying so close attention. And I, so, so personally, you are, in, in my view, you're on to something that I think we are just touching the surface around. Uh, and, and I think that that's, that's going to be, a, obviously, a critical thing that you're inviting people into the conversation around at Canisius. And it's so exciting for Canisius that, you know, to get to wrap their hands around that. Well, it, it, it's exciting because we, we think we start from a real strong base here. You know, um, we, we've had as our tagline for years where leaders are made. And 
it's one of those things that has resonated with alumni. It's resonated with faculty, staff, students, and everyone picks up and says, yeah, sure. And, and one of the reasons that it resonates is people looked at where Canisius graduates went in the world, and particularly here in our uh, upstate New York market, they were looking and saying, at every, in every place where you were looking for leaders, there were Canisius alumni. And, um, and so what I'm saying to people is, let's understand, we, we start from a very strong base. The, the, the question now is, we simply can't market on the basis of anecdotal evidence of, you know, a person here or a person there who became a leader. But we have to demonstrate how the program as a whole does this and how it does it in a consistent way um, and that we have data to back it up and that when the data suggests that maybe we aren't hitting the mark, we use that data to revise the curriculum so that we get it right. That, that is, um, you know, the, the number of areas that this affects, just this, the, this changing in the way you think uh, and, and the way you change student perceptions of the expectations the institution has upon them uh, is, is vast. And yet it's, it sounds like, and, and from the appearance of, of reading about uh, Canisius and active alumni, it sounds like uh, it's, it's a nuanced change that's, that could support a, a huge impact. I, it's wonderful to hear you talk about that. Uh, we have. This has been a fantastic conversation. Do we have any other any other highlights, Howard, uh, on on your list? Things we haven't uh, we haven't hit. Uh, comments, questions that we we haven't addressed in our epic conversation here. No, I'm just. First of all, John, I'm thrilled that you were willing to come on the show, tell your story, especially in advance of uh, you know, and in, in some ways in practice of convocation, but at the same time. Uh, in a sense, a certain kind of uh, moving the conversation forward to looking forward and and to your point about sort of the fatigue factor that people go through. And now it's time to say, you know, maybe we're behind, the worst is behind us. Let's look to the future. And I think that's such a powerful message for not just for Canisius, but for other schools that might be sitting on still some challenges, but there needs to be now a focus on how do we move forward in a positive way. Absolutely, Howard. Uh, again, uh, John, uh, thank you so much for taking your time joining us for this conversation, and, and uh, absolutely, uh, uh, certainly our best on September 4th as you, uh, as you kick off convoca convocation with this message. Well, thanks very much. Howard, do we have any other notes or, or messages for the people? I think we're good. I think we're good. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening to this conversation. You can find out more about the show at tybalink.com. You can subscribe for free in iTunes uh, or your podcatcher of choice. Uh, it's a, the best way to make sure you don't miss a single episode of great conversations uh, uh, like this one that you have just heard today. On behalf of John Hurley, president of Canisius College, and Howard Tybal, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll catch you next week on Navigating Change the podcast from Tybal Inc.